<laughs> Hello. Hello. Welcome back. We are going to finish the book of First Samuel this week. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How that we've um finished this book. It's been a long journey here through the story of Saul and David. There's been a lot, I think, that we've covered and learned about. So as we finish this book, that'll be um we'll be discussing chapters 26 through 31. And kind of a lot of this is stuff that's kind of already happened. So we're gonna kind of breeze through some of these things kind of same old same old um for yeah. example chapter 26 is kind of the same thing as what happened uh before that we talked about last week where you know remember last week david had um kind of um well is it i thought we covered 26 last week no, we didn't. Oh. No. Uh, but remember, David has a couple of opportunities to kill Saul, and he doesn't. Um, and and Saul kind of repents and has a reconciliation with David. Well, in chapter 26, we find out that that reconciliation is short-lived. Saul, again, is paranoid um, and is wanting to kill David. And David, again, has an opportunity to kill Saul, this time by creeping into his camp. Um, and he takes his servant or another soldier with him uh, who tries to convince him. And David, once again, does the same thing. I'm, I'm not going to do this. This is the one that God anointed as king. Um, so David has a sense of honor here, um, but instead he takes the spear and his water jug uh and then tell Saul you know look I I had another opportunity to kill you I don't know why you're after me um and Saul repents again um so that's pretty much chapter 26 I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments on on any of that as I was reading through it it just I'm I just kept thinking my gosh, these people, they must float above the ground or something, because it's amazing to me that nobody in the camp wakes up, you know, there's no crunching of twigs under their feet yeah. that wakes anybody up. And then it says in here, God had put them all into a deep sleep. But it didn't say that when they were in the cave with um, what's his bucket when he was doing his thing. Yeah. And I mean, how many men were in that cave? Really? You, they all stayed quiet and nobody like slipped right. on a rock or, yeah, you know, or you didn't even hear. The it just was amazing them. to me. These people must be really quiet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, I maybe, maybe that's been the case before too, but we weren't told yes. before. Maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. Good I point. wondered that too, yeah. as I was reading through it, I was like, how did they make it into camp without yeah. waking up? And then they're yeah. standing over him having this conversation. And, nobody yeah, and then they were talking to each other. It was just, yeah, it was very distracting. And then I get to the, like almost the last sentence in the chapter, you know, and yeah. you know, God had put them into a deep sleep. So, right. Anyway, that was my weird observation. Yeah. So that's chapter 26. And then chapter 27, we finally see that David is really fed up with this playing hide and seek business just constantly running from Saul and so yeah. David decides to go to, into Philistine territory um he goes to Gath and um because he realizes that Saul isn't going to pursue him there um and so he takes his um his men and their families and his two wives and he lives there for a period of time. So we're told he lives there for a one year and four months. Yep. Um, and um, it's also, I, I find it interesting that during that time then, it, because David is, is their enemy. Um, he's the one that killed Goliath. 
Um, but he makes a friendship with the king of Gath and goes out on these raids and is attacking different Philistine encampments or, or groups and stuff like that. But then he comes back and he kind of lies to the king and he basically is, is telling the king that he's actually attacking Israelites and the king believes him um, yeah. because he doesn't leave anybody alive to say differently. And I think, you know, at first when I read that, I thought it was really like dishonest. I guess it it just didn't sit right with me that he was lying about it. Um, but then I think oh, what I didn't pick up on that. Pretty clever, actually, because yeah. what he's doing is kind of securing then his own like safety. Um that the king trusts him and and believes that he's defected essentially so he's kind of a a spy essentially um a double agent maybe um is what we would call him um so so that's pretty much chapter 27 then is just that whole business of him <laughs> yeah going out and attacking and lying about it Um, and then we move into chapter 28, which I want to spend a little bit of time on, uh, with Saul and the witch of Endor. So Saul really, uh, has gone off the deep end and definitely is not in God's favor at all anymore. God has completely withdrawn himself from Saul and, Saul inquires of the Lord several times and in several different ways, um, but he gets no answer. And so his solution to that is to go to a witch or a medium. Now he had banished all these mediums and witches and everything from Israel, which is according to the law of God. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it's very clear that you're not to not to use those kind of sorcery services and you're not to tolerate them and so he kind of goes undercover disguises himself um to seek out the services of this witch or medium it depends on what your translation says um and i i found it kind of disturbing that not only does he do that, but he also um, swears by the Lord that he's not there um, to set her up, which is um, in verse 10. Well, actually, if you look at verse 9, it says, The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? And then it says, Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Um, this is a direct violation of the second commandment that you should not use the name of the Lord, your God. You should not misuse God's name. So in other words, you shouldn't take an oath um, by the name of God uh, for any kind of dishonest pur purpose, which is what Saul does. So this drives Saul further away mm -hmm. uh, from God. And then um, is it at the beginning of this chapter that we're reminded that um, Samuel had died? No. Yeah, might be, might be after that, or I feel like it's after that. I just can't yeah. remember. Well, anyway, so Samuel remember is the the prophet who had anointed Saul as the king, um, and then anointed David, and so when when Saul goes to this medium, um, 
and she realizes that it's Saul. Um, but he asks her to bring up Samuel from the dead. Um, so apparently he wants to talk to Samuel. And so she does. She brings up um, Samuel from from the dead. And um, Samuel rebukes him for this. Um, Samuel... Oh, you're right. Go ahead. You're right. You're right. Um, uh, uh, verse 3 of chapter 28. Now Samuel was dead. Oh, okay. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, and which was just a reminder for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, Samuel, I'm looking at verse 15. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul says, I'm in great distress. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. And then he gives him a prophecy. He says, the Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. So essentially you and your sons will die. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. Um, so he uses this, this medium to get a message and i think what he's hoping for is that he's going to get some sort of message that he's going to have victory but that's not how it is samuel chastises him even further um because he's consulted a medium um and and saul's fate is fate is sealed now he and his sons will die were you going to say something carl no no oh. i'm agreeing I thought you were starting to say something. No. Um, that's about all I've got to say about that. I don't know if anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> that means uh, David loses a friend. Mm -hmm. Well, that's in chapter 31. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so the prophecy. Still. Yeah, so the prophecy yeah. is that not only will Saul be punished, but his his sons will be punished, yeah. and the nation. Um, so yeah. it's clear that the the actions of the king of Israel are they have an impact on everyone, everyone close to him, and everyone in in the nation. All right. Well, then if we move My to other weird observation. Yeah. So Samuel, um, no, Saul hadn't eaten for three days. Yes. So the woman, <laughs> she had a fattened calf at the house, which she butchered at once. <laughs> some bread, made some, I mean, she gave hey, you yeah. dinner. I'll be back in four hours. I just got to <laughs> butcher the cow. Exactly. And process it. I just let it hang and yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was kind of I I I really as I was reading that, I was like, what's what's the point here? Why are we hearing about this? But yeah. um and and my commentary really only had like a couple of lines in it, it was just that the woman um shows trust. Um, to Saul because he had promised that she would not be punished um, yeah. for, for doing her her witchcraft or talking to dead people or whatever um, and and so then she she takes care of Saul she appreciates that he had promised her that she yeah. would 
She yeah. sure does. That's just <laughs> it was a, a couple of sentences, you know, and it just yeah. it just like that, and it's like this. I can't even imagine what 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 she had to do there, but anyway, caught my made me go hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I when it I when I was reading it, I I was reading it. I was like. Oh, she offers him bread. Well, that's nice. And then it was like she goes to kill the fattened and calf, and I'm like, it isn't bread enough. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you brought that up, Kari, because there are a lot of people who do not understand how long it takes to even prepare a fatted calf. I mean, once you know the skinning, that's everything. What I mean. It's 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 a process. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah, it's just like you know, the woman had a fattened calf at the house, but she butchered at once. I mean, it's a sentence, and then yeah, it's a you know, who knows within an hour, within an within an hour, process. you can't be cooking meat from the it, time. It, you... That just blows me away. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent there. No, just... I think I think that's and and again. This kind of goes to that um, that Middle Eastern custom here of hospitality. Hospitality, um, and you see that over and over and over again in in particularly in these Old Testament scriptures that this this idea of hospitality is super important um, to this culture. It still is to this day, and we even see it in the New Testament. For example, like the story of Martha and Mary. Um, that's that's a whole thing about you know hospitality and stuff too um and you know it's it's a bigger discussion but you see martha doing what's expected and and it, that is to be hospitable to provide a lot for your guests to make sure that they're comfortable well and they waited for <laughs> to get the calf ready so well yeah because it's not yeah. something you can you know have done ahead of time and you keep it in the freezer it's um that's not, <laughs> yeah <laughs> not a climate that that um so yeah well that's a lot of meat yes because you're right like you can't just oh i'm gonna just get a roast and yeah. yeah, but it was a calf, so it wasn't that big. Yeah, it was a kill, calf, but you but can't still. like carve off a hunk of the, you know, cats, the calves. Like, I mean, you're cooking a whole animal here. Yeah, it's just yeah, that's anywhere from three to six hundred pounds, depending on yeah, how well just... fed it's been. Yeah, that's true. Okay, well, we went down a rabbit but, hole with that. Sorry. Well, that's okay. <laughs> rabbit holes are fun. <laughs> <laughs> um chapter 29 is really just kind of i just um actually wrote down kind of one line on my summary on that is that the, <laughs> Phil the philistine leaders reject david um they yeah. um they don't want nothing to do with him they're not buying the whole you know david's our friend <laughs> yeah and they're like send him back and so the king is like, okay, yeah, dude, you got to go back. Um, uh, but then we move into chapter 30 when David does go back and he comes back to something really unpleasant. And that is the fact that the, the whole town that every, you know, that he and his men had left their families behind, that's all been burned. And all of their um, family members have been taken away. Um, they're captured and um, they don't know where they're at they don't know if they're alive or if they're dead or anything like that mm. David's reaction to all of this is interesting he turns to the Lord uh, for an answer here he consults the Lord and he's like if I go looking for them am I going to be victorious in this and and the Lord says yes you will uh, and and that's how it happens. Then David is able to um, he he defeats the Amalekites. If you remember, the Amalekites are the ones that Saul had failed to completely destroy. Yeah. Um, so he defeats them and gets all of the hostages back. 
along with his his wives. I couldn't help but think of current events um, and what's going on in Israel and Gaza. Um, you know, in this, um, you know, places being mm -hmm. burned and, and hostages being taken and all of that. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, I read a lot of this stuff and I think, gosh, it's just the same story spinning over and over and over and over again. It's just history repeats mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, then finally we get to the ending, the concluding chapter of first Samuel. Um, and it's bittersweet. Um, we see that the Philistines now come to full on war, uh, against Israel. And right at the very get-go, we learn that Saul's sons are killed. And Olivia, you're right. This is where David's friend Jonathan then is killed, along with his, is it two brothers? Yeah. Um, there are three sons that are that are killed. Mm -hmm. And um, Saul receives word about this. You know, the army is taking major losses, casualties, the is Israeli army. And... Um, Saul is wounded uh, by some arrows and realizes that if he doesn't die, horrible things are going to have to happen to him. He'll be captured. And because he's the king, really bad things will happen. And so he asks his armor bearer or his aide to kill him with the sword and the aide refuses. Um, so Saul kills himself then. He falls on his sword. And his armor bearer does the same. Uh, and then it's kind of grisly here. Um, then they come, the Philistines come, and they cut off Saul's head, which is, remember, what was done to Goliath. And they take his armor, kind of like the... Um, army of Israel had taken Goliath's sword and they take it to their, one of their pagan temples. And then they, um, they hang Saul's and his son's bodies from, uh, on the walls of Beit Shean. Um, this was interesting to me because that was one of the places that we visited when I was in Israel. It's one of the most well excavated um, ancient cities there. I it was it. I mean, the ruins are amazing. You can still see um, roofs in the the stone. Uh, you know, the roads were made uh, out of stones, and you can see grooves in there from the like um, from the metal wheels. Of like chariots and and things like that, um, <clears throat> so that's where Saul and his sons, where their bodies are hung up, and and it's um it, it's kind of a way a, a way of further humiliating them, and it's just their bodies because of course they had taken their heads, um, and so. I thought it would be good if we just read verses 8 through 13. So does somebody want to read 8 through 13? <sighs> the car is like, yeah, no. Olivia, well, yes. do it. You always have yeah. translation. I like, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, your translation always puts things kind of interesting. I like the, the newer translation it's just the concluding verses of chapter 31 just verses 8 through yeah. 13 yeah uh, the next day when the philistines went out to strip the dead they found the bodies of saul and his three sons on mount Gilboa. so they cut off saul's head and stripped off his armor then they proclaimed the good news of saul's death in their pagan temple and to the people throughout the land of is that philistia yes philistia However, they placed his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths, and they fastened his body to the wall of the city of Beth Shan. 
But when the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their mighty warriors traveled through the night to Bethshan and took the bodies of Saul and his sons down from the wall. They brought them to Jabesh where they burned the bodies. Then they took their bones and buried them beneath the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and they fasted for seven days. Yeah, so um, you get this conclusion of kind of this grisly demeaning end to Saul's reign as king and of course his sons, including Jonathan, David's best friend. Um, and this humiliation, but then you get this group of Israelites who are brave enough to go and get their bodies and take them and they burn their bodies. Now, it wasn't typical to do, to burn bodies. Usually they would bury them, but the belief is probably that they were so um, wounded and probably desecrated and they had been dead for a while. So it was best to just burn them. And then they take the bones and they bury them. And the place where they bury him is the place where Saul won his first victory as king. And we see that in chapter 11 of first Samuel. So the place where Saul is buried then is important. Um, they, they do what they can to honor the king. Hmm. So, so you see Saul's um, reign come to a tragic and demeaning end. And yet still his people treat him with a certain amount of honor and, and respect, which I think is kind of a nice way to end this story then, um, that they're not just left hanging there and humiliated. And my commentary said later that David dug up the bones and moved them. Yeah, and we'll read about that in, in yeah. Second Samuel. Yeah. Do they... Do they mention how David felt about finding out how his friend died? So, <clears throat> that will be in the first chapter of Second Samuel. Will be. Okay. Yeah. No, I was yeah. gonna. I was gonna say that's the only bummer about like the ending this way is that we don't get to hear about that. Right. But you know, and I don't know why. Um, why the books are divided like this because really second Samuel picks up exactly where first Samuel leaves off. Um, so sometimes I, I kind of wonder about, you know, the division of making this into two books. The only reason I can think that they do that is because first Samuel is about Saul's reign as king, yep. whereas yep. second Samuel becomes about David's reign as king. Mm -hmm. um, Makes sense. Yeah. And and so really then kind of the focus now is going to shift uh, to David. So that's where we'll head next now is into okay. Second Samuel. Makes sense. Yeah. So any other comments or questions on any part of First Samuel? Anything that we've talked about or... So we've kind of seen that, you know, the people's desire for a king has solved some of their problems that they were encountering in the book of Judges, but not really. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's kind of brought new problems of its own, especially, you know, with, with Saul um, and his kind of descent into paranoia uh, and this competition uh between him and david and and uh, really the competition comes as a result of saul's disobedience all right cool all right as i said then next time we'll be journeying into second samuel
and we'll start talking about David, King David. All right. Awesome. Let's pray. Gracious God, uh, we thank you for the gift of your word. And we thank you for uh, the, the things that we learn by reading these ancient stories, the fact that, you know, humanity just doesn't change that much. And Lord, we thank you for being so patient uh, with us and loving us through all of our disobedience and our straying off the path. We thank you, Lord, that you finally stepped into uh, our history uh, yourself and became a human being and rescued us from this endless cycle of disobedience and violence. Lord, we pray that you be with us now as we each go our separate ways this week. Help us to always do good and to be kind and to be ready always to share words of hope with those that we meet, the hope that we have in you and your great love for your people. All this we pray in the holy and precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. It was good to be with you again this week, and we will look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>